welcome every everyone. So this is the focus session on information at all length scales from black holes to quantum information in living systems. So this is a uh, uh, sort of organized uh, partially by the Dutch Institute for Emergent Phenomena, uh, DEEP. And for those who do not know, uh, DEEP is um, a broad group of people who try to push for a research program in the Netherlands um, around the subject of emergent phenomena, trying to link it to different disciplines. Um, it organizes multiple uh, scientific activities, such as workshops, conference seminars, and also out outreach activities of different kinds. There's uh, a lot of people involved in it, um, many more than, than those that I portrayed here. These ones are what we call the deep pushers, who try to um, sort of uh, find the opportunities to continue this program even further. But you can find more uh, information at, at this website, uh, deep.org. So, in, in previous years, uh, at Veldhoven, we have organized uh, focus sessions, uh, which have all of them a similar title. Emergent at all length scales in 2019, um, hydrodynamics at all length scales in 2020, and now information at all length scales in 2021. And the idea of these uh, uh, focus sessions is to find uh, tools, methods, techniques that actually connect sort of uh, different scales and different um, areas where um, emergence um, can be studied and perhaps learn from each other. That's why the session is quite broad and there's uh, researchers from quite different um, areas from classical to quantum. And uh, information is one of these sort of tools that you can find in all scales and is used for bulk reconstruction in, in, in sort of holography settings. It's used for uh, the quantum internet or, or large scales um, networks and uh, classical and living systems. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a good tool to understand how information is stored and how it um, sort of portrays the physics at different scales. So the program, as you can also see in uh, the Veldhoven platform, is the following. And it will be chaired by myself and uh, Michael Walter, who is here as well. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot show my face because my computer is not, uh, I don't know what's going on. Um, but that given said, and I already took too much time, um, enjoy. Uh, and if you have any questions, be aware that you're muted, so you have to write them on, on the chat and we will try to filter them and ask the speakers ourselves. So, with that being said, um, I would like to introduce uh, the first speaker, Barbara Terral, who is going to speak about stochastic Hamiltonians and circuit QED. So, um, if I can stop my sharing, Barbara can share hers. Yeah, okay, I couldn't unmute myself until I was <laughs> presenter, so that was, uh, okay, let me just uh, share my screen. Um, yes, um, yeah, so this session is very broad and there's very little time, so I would like to give a little bit of an introduction, I hope you see my pointer, to this paper that we just finished, um, but it will only be an introduction. Um, and maybe I'll spend more time talking about some background. There was a recent other related paper that came out a month later. Um, and basically, this is about the sign problem in circuit QED and um, the sign problem and Hamiltonians that avoid the sign problem that we have called stochastic. And I'll explain to you a little bit about what circuit QED is. Okay, so there's a little bit of a motivation that I'll start with and to sort of summarize the sign problem and kind of make the claim that this is the thing that stands between us and the classical simulation of quantum computers, um, which is a much broader theme, uh, which I won't have time to go into. And then what are the Hamiltonians that we see in circuit QED? And circuit QED is really the theory of um, electric circuits uh, treated quantum mechanically and these electric circuits, you know, they operate at superconducting uh, temperatures. Uh, they are made out of superconductors, very low dissipation, 
And instead of describing them as uh, with QED, quantum electrodynamics, we have a circuit version of these. Huh? And so, uh, but the thing is that in practice, if we use these Hamiltonians uh, to describe hardware, we uh, won't like to treat these systems as qubits. Uh, if we start with quantum electrodynamics, it's a field theory, so we don't have qubits. If we start with circuit QED, we also, we have a discrete set of, uh, um, you know, degrees of freedom, not a continuous set in a field, as in a field theory, but still, um, you know, uh, these are continuous variable systems. <clears throat> and so it takes another step to make them into Hamiltonians. And this is sort of that step. And what that says about the sign problem is what the, our project was about. Okay, so <clears throat> first thing, what is stochasticity? Now, I maybe regret having introduced this term with my colleagues in this paper because it sometimes is it's often misspelled. And it's basically a way of saying that this is a Hamiltonian that avoids the sign problem, but you know, we can have fermions, we can have bosonic systems. And um, this is mostly about Fermi uh, bosonic systems or qubits. And so we say a Hamiltonian is stochastic in a certain basis. If, if just as a matrix, its entries are real and its off diagonal elements are non-positive. And this is a basis dependent definition, right? Because I just look at the Hamiltonian in this basis and the basis is typically, you know, the spin basis um, or the, you know, the qubit basis and so on. And um, uh, it's clear that, you know, and, you know, this basis is important because if I can diagonalize the Hamiltonian, then this property always holds. Its entries are real on the off diagonal, the zero, and on the diagonal, they are uh, real. Um, so, uh, you know, in that basis, it's stochastic. But of course, diagonalizing a many body Hamiltonian is uh, non trivial. So, this, you have to really think about this definition of stochastic as uh, pertaining to many body systems, many qubit systems, and you have a natural computational basis. Um, but of course, you can do some manipulations with this basis. For example, you can do local basis changes, a product of unitary on you know, each qubit of your system, for example. And that's called sort of curing the sign problem. So the Hamiltonian is not stochastic in, that, in one basis, and then you can do local rotation, and then it is stochastic. Um, and so the point is, why are we interested in stochastic Hamiltonian? I say they avoid the sign problem. And um, <clears throat> there are several ways of, uh, of showing this, what I'll show. And um, one of the things is, well, maybe I'll come to this last point uh, later. Yes, yeah, so, so one interest of mine is in, in computer science and is related to complexity theory and complexity theory as being, you know, how hard it is to do task A or B. And so there's a beautiful hierarchy uh, about how hard it is, for example, to determine the ground state energy of a many body qubit system. So if the system is classical, like it's a spin glass, this is NP complete, it's hard for, for classical computers. Now, if this system is a generally quantum system, let's say a Heisenberg model with some local fields, then it's quantum NP complete. It's hard for quantum computers. Depends a bit on what with what accuracy you want to estimate the ground state energy. But then you can ask, what about the ground state energy of a stochastic Hamiltonian? Now, what is a stochastic Hamiltonian? I just gave you a definition. And an example is, for one of the generic examples is the transverse field Ising model. Transverse field Ising model is this Hamiltonian. There's a diagonal term. So I'm looking at the basis of the spin Z basis. So this is diagonal. This is also diagonal. And here on the off diagonal element, you know, you have these X, these transverse fields, and they have a minus sign. And the point is that determining the ground state energy of a stochastic Hamiltonian is also complete for a certain class. And this class is stochastic MA. And that class, if you look at this diagram here, sits between, so this is the class NP, then there's an enlargement that's called MA. You probably are not familiar with this class, but then this is the class stochastic MA, which is contained in QMA, but it's also contained in a bunch of classical classes that you're probably also not familiar with. The only thing I can say that it's believed by computer scientists that AM is actually equal to NP. So if AM collapses down to NP, that drags down stochastic MA and MA to NP. So it kind of says that um, 
you know, stochastic Hamiltonians, the ground state energy problem, is just classically hard. It's a hard search problem, but it doesn't have anything interesting, you know, intri you know, quantum in it. Okay, so now why is this suspect? Why is this property that we defined that um, you know the 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 matrix elements of H are you know non-positive off diagonal? Why is this relevant? Well, it's a very simple thing which you can prove if you look at the Gibbs state. Um, and of course, when you have a low enough temperature, this is a projector onto the ground state. This Gibbs state as a matrix has non-negative entries. Eh? So if I look at it as a matrix, these off diagonal elements say they are non-negative. In general, these are complex, right? There's no reason why they would be non-negative. And that's, uh, that by itself leads to a very straightforward, well-used, uh, often used, a Monte Carlo algorithm. So, for example, you have an observable, and in the, the cases that we'll look at, uh, will just be O is the is H itself is the Hamiltonian, and want to estimate the thermal energy, and so we can write it this way. We can Schrodingerize, and then we can insert complete bases uh, between these factors. This is sort of standard trick. If you work this out, you get something like this. There are some configurations or paths. There's an observable depends on this configuration, and then there's a P of X, and that's a probability distribution. And this is a probability distribution if H is stochastic. In general, it's not. There are ways to avoid it. You know, there's some because this trace is periodic. In some cases, you know, you can absorb some signs. In generally, P of X is a quasi-probability distribution, and that's where the sign problem lies. Yeah, so general Hamiltonians, let's say they're real. P of X is a quasi probability distribution. So we can, one can show that P of X sums to one, but then what do you do with that? Now, when you are a computational physicist, what you do with it, you say, well, I can still use Monte Carlo methods and I can do the following. And it's just a tiny little trick. I just want to show you. Okay, so we have O of X and this is the sum and P of X can be both positive or negative. So I replace P of X by the absolute value and its sign. Then I absorb the sign in with the observable and call that O tilde. And then I also multiply by gamma, so we have some normalization. And I divide by that. And that means that I'll get a new probability, a really genuine probability distribution, P tilde, which is given by this, and a new observable. And so if I'm able to sample from a distribution P tilde, which I can using Monte Carlo methods, which are not guaranteed to converge, but I can try. Then uh, I could, you know, try to estimate the expectation value of this by repeated sampling. But then the question is, how much do, how many samples do I need to take? And this, how many samples I need to take, depends, of course, on the range of this observable, right? Of this O tilde of X. And the point is that this range has been multiplied by this gamma, and this gamma is this factor. And this can be much, much larger than one. And when, when P of X is negative and positive in, in, uh, all, the, all, all over, this can be exponentially large. So the number of samples scales with gamma squared and some other quantities, and that is exactly the sign problem. I can always map something onto some stochastic simulations, but the number of samples that I need to take in order to get a good estimate of my, you know, of my rent, of my expectation value, something close to the, the real value, needs to be very large, potentially exponentially small, exponentially large. And so, like I said before, this sign problem, the use of quasi probability distribution, is actually, uh, you know, is has been used for quantum computations more generally in all kinds of forms. But I think I don't have time to go into this. Now, one thing I want to say is that. Um, you can ask, and this has been a big open problem until 2020, um, you can say, well, if, uh, you know, I have some Hamiltonian, it has no sign problem, uh, I can set up some quantum Monte Carlo process, try to sample from P of X, and uh, I'd like to use this to simulate an adiabatic computation. As so an adiabatic computation, I start with some initial Hamiltonian, and I gradually vary it, and I end up with some final Hamiltonian. And now let's assume that every one of those guys is stochastic, and there's a gap, so there's a good adiabatic path. And now I want to simulate this with some Monte Carlo methods. And so I adjust my Monte Carlo method while I go. Now, can I prove that I can do this if there's no sign problem? 
That's an obvious question. We tried to prove this in 2009. We weren't able to do this. We proved that if the Hamiltonian is in addition frustration free, meaning the ground state is the lowest energy state of every one of those terms, which is not true for you know, the transfer field Ising model, then you can efficiently simulate it. And now there's a recent result this year of a very specific stochastic adiabatic path, not using Hamiltonians, but Laplacians, or no, actually adjacency matrices of a graph. Anyhow, in this result that you can check out on the internet, they show that there are problems by which you know you you the problem that you have to solve is something that's uh, it's it's you have to query some oracle you have to query some properties of a graph and the number of queries that you need quantumly is uh, almost exponential whereas you may can make do with polynomial number of queries classically so this is a big result showing that even if you have no sign problem quantum adiabatic algorithms uh, may have an advantage Okay, so I mentioned uh, an example already of a stochastic Hamiltonian named the transfer field Ising model, but actually all of quantum mechanics, emphasis on mechanics, is has no sign problem. And this also relates to circuit QED. Um, anyhow, so, so let's just take a quantum mechanical system, a trivial Hamiltonian. I have some potential V of X and I have some momentum particle in that potential. And then I can say, well, as a matrix, what does this look like? Well, of course, it's not a matrix, it's an infinite dimensional system, but I can put on a, I can, you know, uh, discretize space, and then I can write a second derivative that pops up in this, uh, this momentum squared. And of course, because P has an I, this is a, a minus second derivative. Huh? And so if I do that, what kind of matrix do I get? I get a matrix which has uh, stuff on the diagonal, which relates to the potential, that's arbitrary. But on the off-diagonal elements, the matrix elements are zero or negative. So it's the question. And of course, you can see that this is true much more, you know, general if I have many particles and so on. Okay, I already mentioned the transverse field Ising model. And also, and this is something that many people already know, that, you know, if this field, let's say these local fields, uh, you know, some of them were were were, were positive. We're coming up with an opposite sign. You can just do a, a, a simple z flip on one of these terms and and cure that sign. Yeah? So that's an example of one of these curing transformations. Okay. So now the main question that motivated our paper and um, and and the results therein is: Can we engineer a true sign problem in circuit QED with static Hamiltonians? So the point is this. There is this company, D-Wave, that's existed for a while, and they say we do quantum computation using an adiabatic algorithm. So our goal is to stay in the ground state or a thermal state of some Hamiltonian, and we gradually change the parameters of this Hamiltonian. Um, so we're not doing circuit-based computation, and uh, you know we're not doing diabatic computing. You're, you're making use of going to higher energy states. And I want to stress this that if you have a stochastic Hamiltonian and you're doing these things, you're not restricted necessarily. It's really property of the thermal and the ground state. Yeah. Okay, so the point is, can they, can we classically simulate what they do in their quantum annealing using quantum Monte Carlo? And what is the Hamiltonian that they get? And so this is, um, this is what I call the master Hamiltonian. Of course, there was always a master of a master Hamiltonian, uh, but th the point is that you know you they I, at the end they like to work uh, their annealing that they do is a transfer field Ising model, but before they get to that is a, um, a, a Hamiltonian that has many more degrees of freedom, and um, you're probably not so familiar with circuit QED. So this the Hamiltonian that you get is from a circuit that has components like Chosen junctions, inductors, and capacitors. But the point is that the Hamiltonian uses a bunch of conjugate variables. And you can think about these conjugate variables as positions and momentum. And the couplings are slightly different because they have different physical origin. There's some potential that has a lot of, you know, it has various terms, but we don't care about the potential. And there is a um, sort of momentum term, but there is a matrix also in there. Okay, so you could also again discretize this and say, well, does it have you know non-positive off-diagonal elements? That's getting a bit awkward. I and mean, there's a different way actually 
Okay, so maybe we want to go to the next slide. There's a different way of analyzing, avoiding. Okay, so the point is this Hamiltonian is stochastic. I can avoid the sign problem. I can set up a quantum Monte Carlo, you know, that has no sign problem and estimate the, you know, thermal energy. That's the point. Now, this Hamiltonian is not the most general. We discuss in the paper, we, you know, we, we avoid some time reversal symmetry breaking circuits, which can be engineered, but you need driving terms. And this is this is also doesn't there's no microwave driving, but anyhow the way the way we what we use is actually something very standard. If you do field theory or other things, maybe statistical physics, that something like a partition function can be written as a path integral associated with a classical Hamiltonian. And this is the typical mapping of oh I have a you know a two dimensional quantum system and I can map it onto a three dimensional classical system. And that trick doesn't work for any Hamiltonian, but for some it works. And for these types of things, it works uh, and you can write this. And then the point is that you can do, use this expression to estimate you know, thermal energies, and therefore you can kind of track the ground state energy of an adiabatic path. We didn't you know, do this uh, in all detail. Okay, so the point is undriven, no microwave drives or other time reversal symmetry breaking terms, Circuit QED master Hamiltonians are stochastic. But now the point is, we had, there was a paper, let me just look at the, there's a paper in 2020, demonstration of a non-stochastic Hamiltonian in a coupled superconduct, in coupled superconducting flux qubits. <clears throat> These systems are examples of the Hamiltonian that I showed. So this looks like a contradiction. They say that they can get a non-stochastic Hamiltonian out of a master Hamiltonian of coupled superconducting flux qubits that is manifestly, I would say, stochastic. So how does this happen? This is what we wanted to understand. And the point is that, uh, oops, sorry, I'm just going the wrong way. How many, how much time do I still have? Um, oh, uh, three minutes. Minute, two minutes, right. yeah. yeah. Okay, so maybe then this will be just an advertisement. So the point is this. I have what I do, so I have to do something in order to go from a Hamiltonian that, uh, you know, has positions and momenta and some potential to qubits. So what I typically do is I look at the potential, for example, for the flux qubit, you know, every flux qubit is a double well potential. Yeah? And so the double well potential has a symmetric and anti-symmetric, you know, lowest two states. And I would just want to project onto the state space uh, spans, you know, the space spanned by those two states. And then I add couplings and then I project those couplings also in that, you know, these low lying subspaces. And then I can, you know, examine what kind of Hamiltonian I get. And of course I make small errors in this. So one, this is sort of, you know, cautious. One has to do this, but this type of procedure, sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm actually, oof, oof, I'm sorry. I'm just, uh, Seems like I'm not going back in the right way. Oh yeah, this is the wrong button. Okay, um, <laughs> just going arbitrary, random walk through my slides. Um, so, so what our question was: Can I have some rigorous procedure, some Schrödinger perturbation theory, or maybe just using lowest order in which I project onto you know the the lowest order uncoupled eigenstates? Can that procedure lead to a Hamiltonian that is non-stochastic? Now I said it's non-stochasticity is something with respect to bases. So I should be able to allow myself local basis changes, at least. Maybe I could have some you know, two qubit gates that make the structure somewhat less local, but let's ignore that. And we don't know of any such example, and there's actually no theorem that says we cannot. And what this would show is, is sort of uh, something like this. You know, we have, if I have a Hamiltonian on a qubit system, I could say, well, I can cure the sign by some local basis changes sometimes. But maybe there are other tricks, tricks by which I can cure the sign. Maybe that Hamiltonian is actually the low energy effective Hamiltonian of some master Hamiltonian in which every qubit is replaced by a D level system. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, and that's a way of curing this time. So I need to do my simulation with these D-level systems and then my Monte Carlo methods will work. So there's maybe a whole hierarchy of non-stochasticity. 
Uh, something that's really non-stochastic cannot be cured by any, you know, going to any larger space and so on. Yeah, so that's 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 basically the question. And we made some progress on this, but I have to say our results were more focused on uh, when the low projected Hamiltonian was had a sign problem or not, and the type of couplings are them. So I'm gonna skip over this. So um, if you want to learn more, you should look at the paper. And so what I say, I think we have increased our understanding of how they, how this OSFI done at all these paper get an example of something that's non stochastic I think it's not excluded, but the problem is a little bit is that in no way do we, do they apply perturbation theory in a fairly rigorous manner. Uh, and so if you, your Hamiltonian is non stochastic at a level that's the same order as the terms you collect in your perturbation theory, you don't really have a rigorous result. So it's still a bit of a mystery to me, but we try to, you know, describe also for the people who work on experiment, what are the necessary conditions for you to get something that's non-stochastic? And it's still an open question whether it's actually useful. Huh? The idea is they made this Hamiltonian because they think quantum annealing yeah, that stochastic can be classically simulated. So let's engineer some non-stochastic couplers. And so that hardware may be more powerful for, you know, quantum adiabatic algorithms. And we show, well, it's not because there was this master Hamiltonian um, that you can use to simulate things. Okay, I'd like to stop here. Um, I could stop. Okay, yeah. thank you very much for this uh, uh, great talk. Um, I wanted to remind people that if they want to ask a question, they should write in the chat. Um, so if anyone has a question, a quick question, since we're a bit late, do write in the chat. Uh, here, okay. So uh, there's a question. Is it possible to play this game in the other direction? That is start with a high dimensional Hamiltonian and try to argue that throwing away only a few degrees of freedom maintains Stock plasticity. Uh, yeah, well, that's what the, um, that's what you'd like to do. Uh, so the first thing you think, okay, we have perturbation gadgets that preserve stock plasticity. That say um, we uh, we have a stochastic term, and then we have a stochastic master Hamiltonian. But uh, I don't see in the perturbation theory itself any evidence that it should preserve the stochasticity. At least I can't, I don't know. No. But it's, yeah, yeah, so it's just open. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I think we have to move on to the next speaker. So I'll let uh, Michael now chair the session. All right, um, thanks so much, Barbara. I'm, I'm trying to uh, loop in Stephanie. Uh, who should uh, have presented superpowers now, I think. Hi, Stephanie. Yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, um, I've uh, pre-recorded my talk to make sure I stick within the 14 <laughs> minutes and 30 seconds. So I'll uh, I'll play that and then I can answer questions after that. Uh, Amazing. Maybe I, I also say a few words while while you uh, set up and, and share yeah. your video recorder. So yeah, we are very happy to Stephanie uh, Wiener uh, speak. Um, um, well, in both a pre-recorded and a live fashion today to us. Um, she's uh, the Anthony van Leeuwenhoek professor in, in Delft, working in quantum information. Um, and, and I guess, uh, well, she's really an excellent and a very appropriate speaker for the session on information or length scales because she's using the very small uh, particles to uh, try to hook them up on very large length scales to build a quantum network. And I think that's also what we learn about today. Um, so very excited um, uh, to hear. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> About what she has to report. Yeah, yeah thanks, Michael. So I'll, I'll keep it to an overview given that the time frame, and then you can ask me questions afterwards. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um... I see a small window um, sort of on a large screen. I'm not sure if you can maximize or make it full screen. But oh, perfect. Yeah, I think that's good. But there is no audio at this point. Oh, there's no audio. <laughs> um, 
Sorry, guys. I really thought that this would be very helpful. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but I, I think it, you know, since you kept to the time in the recording, we will, we will be totally okay. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so, so there is when when you share, there's an option for optimizing for motion and video. Um, okay. That you have in a drop down menu when you click on share, and I think that's what's missing. Uh, I see. Yes, great. Okay, I see. Uh, to work towards the blueprint for quantum internet. <laughs> Perfect. The goal of the quantum internet is to ultimately uh, enable entanglement for everyone. Or in the context of this session, entanglement at all length scales possible on Earth. And with this entanglement, of course, one can pursue very interesting physics experiments. Uh, but if you're curious, there's also many user applications actually that are interesting to implement, depending on the stage of quantum internet development. So we've classified this a few years ago, and if you're interested in what do quantum networks need to do in order to enable specific kinds of applications, please have a look at our article. So going forward, one wants to work on three directions in quantum networking. The first is functionality, meaning we want to be able to build a network that can not only do quantum key distribution, but ever more complex application protocols. Second is accessibility, meaning that we would like to allow access to such networks as early as possible. And third is the distance, meaning that we would like to be able to generate entanglement over very long distances in an efficient manner. To give you some idea of what's possible right now in entanglement generation, I will give you a few numbers. So on the ground, meaning in fiber, it is possible to do uh, the devices that put uh, fulfill a single task, namely quantum key distribution, QKD, in such a way that it is not extendable to longer distances uh, over deployed fiber of roughly 100 kilometers using a variety of commercial devices and in the lab at around four to 500 kilometers. In order to enable quantum communication over longer distances, one wants to do something more sophisticated. So one has produced entanglement between two quantum memories at uh, 1.3 kilometers of physical distance, so the nodes really are separated, They're connecting two quantum processors. And more recently, however, two both of these nodes being in the same lab, which makes an important difference because one doesn't need things like phase stabilization, for example, one has now done that over 50 kilometers. From space, so meaning that there's a satellite in space that sends entangled two qubits to both uh, to two points on Earth. Uh, one has bridged in a post-selected fashion, meaning that the one only looks at the detection event and ignores the non-detection events. Uh, one has produced entanglement from satellite over a bit more than 1,200 kilometers. So the question that we're interested in is how can we actually extend this or maybe connect the space to a ground link or also importantly to make it really available for everyone um, enable quantum communication in fiber over very long distances. So the question that I want to like to talk about and present a few tools for studying it is how can a quantum repeater actually be built in the real world? So how can we find a blueprint to make that actually happen? So in this talk, I want to give you an overview of a number of tools that we've developed in order to answer this question. The starting point of this investigation is a real world network topology. So for the purpose of this talk, let's consider a part of the SurfNet core network I depicted here, where a few users want to communicate within the Netherlands. So given such a network topology, um, we then have developed some tools for pre-optimization, for example, a tool for pre-optimization of repeater placement. So without going into the detailed physics yet, we want to make an educated guess of where it would be best to actually place repeater stations on this network. Based on the selection of where repeater stations would be on the real-world fiber grid, 
we can then think about what hardware platform should we be using? Um, what are the parameters? So how good do these quantum devices need to be in order to enable entanglement generation? And um, I'm not going to talk about this here. Also, how good does a control plane need to be in order to enable entanglement generation at the proper rates? We can also develop the tools actually to on a simulated version of the network that allows us to study how well certain quantum devices work, perform parameter optimization using machine learning to answer questions like, what is the minimal requirements? How good do these parameters need to be? Or also questions like, what parameter is more important than another? And out of this, we then get a requirement, so a blueprint for how we might actually realize such networks in the future. So, the first tool that I want to talk about here is the pre-optimization of a quantum repeater placement. So we start with a network grid, for example, the SurfNet core network here. And here in the or orange squares, we have a number of users, so end nodes that really want to communicate with each other um, over the network. In any network, one cannot just put repeaters anywhere, but there are some physical constraints to this. So in this example, we can only put repeaters at the uh, places where there's um, uh, an empty circle. And the question is now, how do we now place repeaters on this grid in order to enable the orange nodes to pairwise generate entanglement at a desired fidelity and rate, while simultaneously minimizing the number of repeaters in the network? So to this, we have a, a solution in terms of an li integer linear programming formulation. So integer linear programming, meaning that for every node, there's a variable saying, yes, there's a repeater there, or no, there's no repeater there. And it takes as input the required levels of robustness. So the user still should be communicating, either, even if some repeaters temporarily become unavailable. The inquired entanglement rate, so how fast do these uh, nodes want to produce entanglement between them the desired entanglement fidelity. And it also takes as input, of course, the network topology, uh, the hardware quality, meaning what is the uh, fidelity of the entanglement that the repeaters can actually produce with their neighbors in the network, and what we call the repeater capacity, which is the number of neighboring entangled things that a repeater can establish simultaneously at any one time. The output of this algorithm is then a, a, a placement of nodes in the network, such that entanglement can be distributed with the required rate and fidelity, and the network has the required level of robustness. So for those of you who are familiar with integer programming, you might say, hey, this is difficult to do computationally. So why don't we do what's a useful trick quite often in quantum information theory and approximate it? this integer program using, for example, a linear program over the rails. So this is not desirable here um, because we can actually solve this integer linear program for a um, decent sized network of around 100 nodes in a very um, uh, uh, decent time frame. So you can see here it takes around 80, uh, somewhere between 60 and 80 seconds to sim solve this problem on a network of 100 nodes which of course um, is commensurate with the size of a neutron quantum network. So for example, a solution where we might ask, you know, let's generate entanglement at a rate of one birds with a certain fidelity, you can find that in our paper, then the output of the algorithm would be to say, hey, at the blue nodes, we're going to put a repeater. So I don't have time to talk more about this, but I encourage you to have a look at our paper. So given that we have a a uh, hint for where to actually put the repeaters in the network. The question is then what hardware platform to choose and how good the quantum devices, the quantum hardware actually needs to be in order to produce such entanglement. So for this, we've developed a simulation platform called NetScript, a network simulator for quantum information using discrete events. And this discrete event paradigm importantly allows us to very accurately model time and understand time dependent noise that may affect the quality of entanglement generation. So that's what is a little bit like Lego, and then one can make detailed physical models of the individual devices and then Lego it together to study large networks. So if you're curious about it, please download our simulator, you can do so for free, and there's also a paper on the archive. 
So I'll give you here just one simple example of a, a very simple small question that one can study for the purpose of this talk. Namely, one might ask, if one wants to build a repeater on atomic ensembles, how good does a candidate architecture be? And in particular, for example, does there exist a viable architecture based on SPDC sources? So what is this question more precisely? You see here a picture where we want to produce entanglement between A and B, or the quantum memories, QM of A and B, via an intermediate repeater called R here. And how atomic ensemble uh, memories work, I guess I cannot talk in detail in this talk, is that one tries to produce entanglement actually in a multiplex fashion between these quantum memories, where there's an outside source, in this case an SPDC source, that sends a signal to the quantum individual quantum memories and also a central beam splitter station, um, where depending on the detection events, entanglement uh, is heralded between these two quantum memories. So the question is now, is an SPDC source good enough in order to make that happen? So the answer that one can then very easily see is that even for otherwise perfect parameters, using an SPDC source in this particular setup never leads to a functioning repeater. So the only sources of noise here are multi-pair emissions according to the SPDC source, and of course, fiber attenuation due to the distance of the noise. So you can see here a plot where there's a blue line that says how well one could, in theory, uh, generate key between two nodes A and B over a certain distance using the best possible devices without a repeater. And of course, if we build a repeater, then we should be doing better than what is possible than direct transmission. So you can see here that the secret key rate for different mean photon numbers, MPN, never exceeds the blue line uh, for this SPDC source. So this tells us, you know, we need something more. We need a better photon source or number of resolving detectors, for example. So this is how we can use our simulation platform. And if we made a selection of sort of a candidate, we might ask sort of, you know, how good do these parameters need to be? And what are the more important parameters in order to approve in a quantum device in, act in order to actually bridge distances? So for this, we've developed a methodology of parameter optimization using machine learning, where we optimize entanglement generation and distribution using genetic elements. So how this works is that we have already set up a particular simulation of a candidate repeater platform, for example, connecting um, Delft and Eindhoven. And um, uh, we input sort of the um, hardware or the, the parameters of the present day quantum device. For example, what is its T1 and T2 time? Uh, what is the uh, rate of entanglement generation and so on? We also input a cost function that tells us um, how difficult it is to, how do we measure the cost of improving certain parameters. Our methodology can in principle work with any cost function. We use one of the, as an example of diminishing returns, meaning that small improvements are cheap and large improvements are expensive. And then we will use this genetic algorithm machinery that evolves to a new population at each instance um, to search for the parameters that improvements that have the lowest cost in order to bridge a desired um, uh, functionality of the network, for example, producing entanglement at a specific rate. So I'll give you an example where we might ask questions like, what are the minimal repeater parameters distributing one entangled pair of fidelity 0.7 per second? So meaning minimal parameters, the smallest improvements, of the minimal cost over the current hardware. So here we use the simulation um, uh, and a already decision of where the repeaters are, uh, and then we want to minimize this cost. So you see here a plot actually, and you know it's not like I said we have a cost function of diminishing returns, but the important part of this um, plot is that with each generation of the genetic algorithm we improve and eventually indeed also converge uh, to a possible output. So if you want to know more about this, please read our archive paper. So if you want to learn more, but you don't, of course, have your own hardware at home, you can download our discrete event simulator. Or somewhat more simple, we have an application simulator that can actually run on different um, laptops to form a quantum network that you can use in order to explore how to program quantum networks in the future. Um, you might also have a look on edX or on our website. Thank you very much. Great. 
Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, wonderful. Um, are there any questions from, from the audience who unfortunately has to type and cannot speak? Welcome, everyone. Today, I want to talk about our efforts oh, oh. to work towards yeah, the Stephanie is looping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, perfect. <laughs> um, maybe uh, while people are typing, I have a, a, a question. Um, uh, so so in, in your first application, um, when you described this integer program, um, could you use a similar ideas for classical routing or what's what sort of maybe more generally what's different between quantum routing and classical routing, maybe even independently from the integer program. Are there a, a special challenges that, that arise. I hope you can hear me Stephanie. Because I cannot hear or see you. Am I frozen or. No, you're not, you're not, you're not. I think it's Tiffany. Yeah. Okay. Mm. It's no good. Just check. Well, and that. Oh, web has crashed. I, I see. Uh, Stephanie just wrote in chat. Well, re very sorry, Stephanie. Um, I'm not sure if it will recover. Uh, oh, you! Oh, I see. Oh, you're back. Uh, let me, give me one moment. I'll try to switch you back. How does that work? Ah. Hi. So uh, it seems I couldn't unmute myself when I rejoined after Webex crashed. <laughs> so I heard the last part of a question about integer linear uh, integer linear programming. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. What I wanted to what I was going to ask is, is sort of if if you could say just a few words on the difference between classical and quantum routing. What are the new challenges there? Uh, so um, that I think it's good to define exactly what is the definition of routing actually before we talk about that question. So um, quite often the definition of routing means that two nodes in a network have a demand, say they want to produce entanglement at a specific rate, and then a, the network needs to be instructed or say packets need to be routed in order to make that happen. So if we take that definition of routing, <laughs> then um, the, then classically, the, there's actually many differences. Let me just mention some of them. So in the uh, classical regime, routing is quite often done by forward communication on a packet-based network. So uh, information is split up into small chunks called packets, and then they're sent forward from the sender to the receiver. And at each node, a decision can be made, like so send packet to the left or to the right um, uh, at, uh, at each time step. So in the quantum case, where we want to produce entanglement between uh, two endpoints, um, uh, of course, if one imagines one would send quantum information using forward communication, then this could work in a similar way. But this is not sort of how anyone envisions that sort of near-term networks can actually, or even far-term networks could actually be realized. So in this case, then it means that one needs to, uh, it, one could do two things, actually there's many differences, but one thing that one can exploit is that one actually builds up some entanglement in the network to begin with. Um, for example, between, say, let me call it the sender or A and, uh, and some other nodes in the network that are dynamically being produced. And then when a demand to connect A and B by entanglement comes in, specific uh, entanglement swappings uh, are done on the entangled state. So that's one way of doing it. One might, of course, imagine that one uh, builds up multi-part that entanglement and then measures out some of the state, but that seems uh, technologically highly challenging, or maybe it's not the way forward. Um, yeah, so uh, there's, there's many differences that come from the fact that entanglement is a connected element and also come from the fact that one does not want to do forward communication in the network. I'm not sure that I've answered so the much. question in full extent. No, that, that, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I. Are there any, maybe a last uh, quick question from someone? Um, if not, then maybe in the interest of time, I will not ask my other question, um, but, but thanks very much, Stephanie, for, for your talk. Thank you. That was great. Uh, so now I think I hand it over back to Jay, who will introduce Greg. Yes, um, so I can see that uh, Greg is here now. Um, I'll just give him... Um, Right. Yeah, my apologies for the change and yeah. Yes. So uh, are, are you able to share your screen? Uh, hold on one second.
No, not yet. Hold on a second. I'll be there in a minute. I think I think Greg dropped for some reason. Or... Seems like he's back. Hi, Greg, can you share now? Yeah, I think so. Okay, okay. okay. Oh, perfect. So it's a, uh, okay. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Greg Stephens from uh, VU, and um, he's going to uh, speak about uh, how uh, some some aspects of information theory used in uh, modeling living systems. So thanks a lot, and go ahead. All right, thank you, thank you for the organizers, and apologies, there was a miscommunication on my part on um, uh, the time of the talk. So it's a it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, everybody can see my slides. I take it. Yep. Uh, so what I'd like to talk to you about today is a way that we think about theory. I, the, the, the title is on purpose provocative uh, in living systems, which are just in principle so complex, especially on the scale of organisms that we work on, that it doesn't seem like the normal ways we have of thinking about theory uh, from sort of fundamental physics are going to apply. Okay, so uh, uh, just to start off before, so I don't run out of time. This is, of course, work done in our group, and there's a lot of postdocs and students who are all part of the process, and I want to thank them. We also uh, welcome anyone who wants to visit virtually for the moment, but in person, maybe ideally, hopefully later this year. And for anyone who's interested, there is that we do have a postdoc position available in the group. Okay, so in physics, theory can be astonishingly, astonishingly successful. And I, I came to biophysics from a road in general relativity and quantum gravity. So perhaps some of you will remember or have seen such a slide before. This uh, comes from the, the manuscript of the first uh, recorded observation of gravitational waves from two interferometer detectors, uh, in this case in the US. And um, not only is that is that a beautiful sort of demonstration, and, and now we have the ability of doing sort of gravit gravitational wave astrophysics, but also this was this was a prediction of Einstein's theory of gravity. And one of the things I'd like to point out to you is the scale of the detections or the deflections that are detected in these interferometers. These are kilometer long evacuated tubes where you, you split light at a junction send it down one arm or an orthogonal arm, and if a gravitational wave is present, uh, you will get a small, dis dis a small deflection on the scale of approximately an atomic diameter over, this, over the uh, course of a kilometer. So that's an incredible pre uh, uh, precision, and the only way that we can do that is we actually have a sense of what the underlying theory is. There's tons of other perturbations that are happening to these experiments. While you try to be isolated, there's earthquakes, there's someone moving uh, Earth somewhere far away from the interferometer. But we have a theory, and we can use that theory to, um, uh, to uncover these beautiful signals in the world. Okay? But living system, even, even some of the simplest living systems, you know, made of multiple complex molecules, molecules into cells, cells into networks, networks into brains, and brains into whole societies, it's really hard to see how any kind of similar approach will work to understand um, how a living system will work. We don't have obvious symmetries. 
You might think that there are accidents of evolution. So how can we make progress as theorists in such a complicated uh, uh, system as a living system? This is going to be obvious to many physicists, but it, it's worth pointing out that it's not always the case in biology. To do precise theory requires precise measurements. And in our group, uh, we think about how organisms move. So we think about biophysics on the scale of entire organisms. And what that means is uh, you want to think about, for example, this movie I'm showing you now is the, the center line, the posture, the shape of one of the model systems of biology. This is a nematode worm, uh, Canaharditis elegans, or C. elegans for short. You can read more about uh, some of our recent work um, on this animal in this reference. It means that we want to capture sort of the full posture dynamics of that animal. This is sort of just like you have, uh, you, your posture is dictated by all the, the, the joint angles. Here we can just measure the center line curvature of this animal. If you think about collected behavior, so, you know, this is something we think about a lot in statistical physics as, as, as physicists. Here, of course, we have a whole well, here we have a whole society of uh, of organisms, in this case of bees. And just as in sort of kinetic theory, to understand the, the collection of what those bees are doing in a whole hive, this could be about a thousand bees, you want to be able to track every one of those molecules or every one of those organisms. Uh, we're able to do that now with some of the remarkable advances in machine vision. And finally, uh, the third system that we work on uh, is, is sometimes you want to image systems in, you want to image animals in their natural environment. So these are, these are swimming fish. You want to image them in three dimensions with their posture dynamics. And, and uh, again, we can sort of use modern image processing to, to look very carefully at how, this, in this case, two fighting fish, two male fighting fish are interacting. Okay. Um, now, how, given those precise measurements, would we start to think about applying theoretical ideas to, um, to organisms? Well, here's, again, uh, a better example, a more close example of the kind of system that we work on. This is this, this worm, C. elegans, moving in two dimensions. On the left-hand side, you see the location of a tracking microscope in a red square. So the worm is about a millimeter long, and we've given it an environment that's about 10 centimeters in diameter. So there's a, there's a copper ring that's confining the worm. And this is in collaboration with a longtime experimental biophysics collaborator, Will Root, University of Toronto. You get these beautiful sort of uh, silhouettes of what the posture of the worm, how the posture of the worm is changing in time. And one of the, one of the things I like about explaining what we do to, to physicists is I can just state the, theory, the, the the fundamental question at the beginning just by having you look at the video. There is no model for understanding how that little worm moves, all right? So uh, it is one of the simplest, simplest living systems uh, with a nervous system. It only has about 300 brain cells in its brain. You have about 100 billion, so it's much simpler than you. Only has a thousand cells in its entire body. We know how those cells are connected with each other in the brain. We also know a lot about we. It's a fully sequenced uh, organism, so we know all about its genes. So even for the simplest of animals, it's not really simple. And it would seem that any sort of first principle process where you start by modeling all the atoms or all the molecules and all the connections isn't just going to be possible. Yet, if you think from top down, how the organism moves, and in this case, we start by constraining or in interrogating the space of shapes, the space of postures, that space turns out to be remarkably simple. In fact, uh, if you give me any posture, then I can describe that posture of this particular worm, sorry, of this particular species in two dimensions as a linear combination of four sort of fundamental directions in the space of shapes. So four is a lot simpler than you might have thought, but this applies to you too. So you have all these degrees of freedom in the muscles in your, in your body. You don't use them all independently. So you also move through a lower dimensional space. And if we can find it, then we'd have a simpler way of describing sort of the, the kinematics of how you move. We can try to do the same. We can look for the same kind of simplicity uh, in dynamics. 
The challenge is we don't have equations of motion. So we need to develop ways of interrogating moving things, dynamical things, without knowing the underlying equations of motion. And in dynamical systems theory, there have been approaches to this in the past. There are, in fact, beautiful mathematical theorems about how in idealized situations, even if you don't know the equations of motion, certain properties of the dynamical systems are accessible to you if you build the right kind of analysis. So this is some of a recent analysis that we've built where you have an underlying dynamical system that you don't know, you measure some aspect of that system over multiple time delays, you do something called a delay embedding, and out of this process comes an approximation of the underlying dynamics. And all of this is done without learning the equations of motion, without modeling the, the equation of motion. So this is called state space reconstruction. And we've developed a technique for doing this, making use of op optimal prediction and using short time multidimensional delays. So we learn from interrogating the dynamics of something without actually knowing the equations of motion. Well, one thing you learn, just like we learned with posture, is how many state space variables, how many phase space variables actually underlie the dynamics. And again, the answer in the worm is it's a lot simpler than it could have been. In fact, there are seven for the particular behavior that we interrogate. Two of them correspond to forward crawling, the worm going forward. Two of them correspond to the worm going backward. And three of them correspond to the worm uh, turning. Right? So seven in total but you can go deeper. And that is, there are a collection of what are known as uh, invariant ergodic properties of dynamical systems. These are properties that characterize the dynamics in a way that's independent of whatever parameterization you have for the equations of motion. The important set of those properties are the Lyapunov exponents. These exponents describe in your, in this case, a seven dimensional space, if I start a seven dimensional ball and I let that ball evolve, then some of those directions will expand, some of those directions will contract, and some of those directions will remain the same. And by expand, they mean they will exponentially expand. If they contract, they exponentially contract, and otherwise they will remain the same. And we typically associate chaotic dynamics with positive exponents. In this case, the worm has two of them. So two of these directions seem to be deterministic unpredictability, deterministic variability. One, one zero uh, exponent comes from continuous symmetry of time translation invariance, and three of them correspond to dissipative dynamics. And if you look closely at that spectrum, Remarkably, it looks very similar to what a damped-driven Hamiltonian system would look like. So this, this dynamics, this impl emergent simplicity that we see in this dynamics leads us to an underlying assumption or underlying sort of uh, equivalence class for how we actually might build uh, models for these dynamics. Okay. You can, you can further expand this this approach, this inverse approach, where instead of assuming that there's a deterministic dynamics, you, you, uh, you think about a stochastic dynamics. And some of you will remember this kind of transformation from your physics class, where you start with a Langevin equation, some sort of stochastic equation for trajectory. But you don't have to think you could solve this trajectory if you want, but f could be super complicated, so it could gamma. So instead of thinking about the trajectories themselves, you can think about the probability space of these trajectories. That's this density rho. And the advantage of thinking about this probability density, so this transformation for, for f as a, a into, turns this into a Fokker-Planck equation, the advantage of thinking about this transformation is that rho now evolves as a linear system. So if we can approximate rho from data, then we can turn our dynamics into a linear operator and apply all the sort of linear techniques that we're used to uh, in terms of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So just to give you uh, just a very quick uh, summary, you start with a particle. This, for example, is a particle in a double well. You could start with the trajectories, but if you looked at the density, I started with a density in one well, it's going to evolve and eventually in equilibrium, of course, the density will leak over and there'll be equal amounts of density in both wells. What you may not remember is there is a long time scale in this process, which is uh, how long it takes a particle to hop from one well to another. 
that long time scale emerges as one of the emerges from the eigen from the spectrum of this uh, Fokker Planck operator, and you could actually find it uh, from data. So let me give you an example of how that works in a system. Uh, so first of all, from if you're doing this from data, then you can learn this effective Fokker Planck or transfer operator it transfers the density from one time to another by just counting transitions from a partition state space at one time to another. So you build a representation of this matrix of the operator through this matrix P. The eigenvalues and eigenvalue and eigenvectors of this matrix P tell you a lot about these long long-term collector dynamics. In this case, this first eigenvector, psi2, actually splits the state space into two partitions. So if we went back to the double well in detail, you can start with the equation of motion. You know that that will mean the system is hopping back and forth between one well or the other. But you can, in this, in this ensemble language, you can learn this transfer operator P, find that the first eigenvalue uh, the first non-trivial eigenvalue of that transfer operator is asymmetric between the two wells. And in fact, the first non-trivial eigenvector will tell you the hopping rate. If you've ever tried to compute the hopping rate analytically from two wells, you know that's a non-trivial calculation. Okay, so just starting to wrap up, we think generally about three kinds of theoretical ideas that come together to understand living systems. There's dynamical systems, which usually mean characterizing your system in terms of state space, attractors, chaos, and predictions. What I talked to you about was, uh, was state space reconstruction when you don't know the system. In statistical physics, of course, we think about order parameters, we have large numbers, you might have effective, uh, effective sort of uncertainty because you're paying attention to a large number of things. And I talked about the ensemble dynamics of data. And then uh, for information theory, which sort of underlies all of this, we're looking at sort of entropy as the universal measure of uncertainty, and then information theory writing down maximal predictive uh, embeddings and thinking about entropy rate and entropy production in ways of characterizing this living system. So just to, to wrap up, um, put all these, this is not, we're not, this, this gives you, I think, a sort of understanding for how the science that we're doing works through astrophysics from some, some years ago. The first, the first step, of course, is to measure everything quantitatively and completely. And that's what Tycho Brahe did when he started looking at planetary motions. But then, then along comes Kepler and Galileo, who are able to take those precise measurements and distill those measurements into patterns and empirical laws, on top of which eventually Newton was able to generalize and write something like a generalized theory of gravity. So uh, that doesn't just apply to planets, but applies to apples falling from trees and so on. And what I'm suggesting is in complex living systems, what we think of as fundamental, fundamental theory, that is what we learn from dynamical systems, from statistical physics, from information theory, has an incredibly strong role to play in knowing, even in the, in, the, in the data that we measure, what kind of equivalence class of system we're dealing with. We need that theory before we're able to generalize and, and write down general principles. So with that, I will thank you. And uh, I, thanks for the opportunity and apologies for the miscommunication on the timing. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Greg, for this uh, really, really clear talk. Um, there was a question here on the chat, and uh, I remind everyone if uh, they want to ask questions, they should write on the chat. So the question was, um, is the reduction of motion space to four degrees of freedom exact, or you should think of this as an approximation? Uh, great. So there's, there's two reductions. So in terms of the posture space, uh, you can measure sort of how, how much remaining posture you don't capture with these four dimensions, and it's incredibly small. It's about 3 or 4%. Uh, also, I should say that that reduction isn't specific to any one worm or any one genotype or actually largely any environment as long as you're in two dimensions. So it generalizes across all kinds of different perturbations. Uh, in, and the same, the same kind of ideas hold in the, uh, in the dynamics. So when we had talked about the seven-dimensional state space, 
it's always an approximation because we're always dealing with data, but the amount of the, the amount of remaining information uh, that's not captured by that seven dimensions is incredibly small. All right. Um, there, there is a, a, another question here, maybe it's a bit too general, but let's see. Um, uh, is it possible to infer equations of motion from knowing the attractor? Um, th there, that's an interesting question. So uh, the answer is, a qu is, is yes, but. So in, in simple systems, and, and people are, so this becomes becoming a very active topic now, uh, you are able to reconstitute equations of motion when when all you know is from data. But but I want to caution you that even in simple dynamical systems, often the equations of motion don't tell you that much, especially if you're learning them from data. You don't know you're not you know you might just sort of make an arbitrary fit and you don't know what's in the equations of motion. So it's important, like such like the Lyapunov spectrum that we showed, you need to interrogate those equations before you have any real understanding of what they're telling you. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, in the interest of time, we uh, have to unfortunately stop here. So let's uh, thank Greg again uh, for his talk and uh, I'll pass on to Michael, who will introduce Eric, uh, our final speaker. Great, let me just yeah. stop. Thanks so much, Greg. Beautiful talk. Uh, great. So let me just make Eric presenter. Um, let's see. There we go. Eric, can you? Uh, I'm unmuted. Oh, yes, I need to share. Yes. Yeah, so while, while you do that, um, maybe let me just say, so, so now we have the, the last talk of the session um, on information or length scales. And um, it's great to have uh, Eric Philander um, uh, speak speak today um, in the session. And, and, and again, his talk, you know, just like the other talks is very fitting in this context. Um, he's going to talk about uh, black holes, pretty long yeah. objects, um, but how quantum information can help understanding them um, more microscopically. And so again, the large and the small comes together. So Eric, if you're ready, then uh, I'll hand over the uh, microphone to you and yes. uh, please take it away. You see the Thanks. slides? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, I want to remove the bar from the bottom. Any, you see only the slides or do you see my bar on the... Uh, I see only the slides. Okay, that's good. So, um, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. I learned about this very recently, actually, because there was a cancellation. So I had to prepare this talk um, actually in the last few days. Um, so I'm going to talk about a topic, uh, well, which I've been working on for a long time and uh, some recent developments that have happened there. I mean, it's it's kind of an advanced field. I mean, uh, we've see, recently seen a lot of, um, well, overlap between people working on quantum information theory and people thinking about quantum gravity and black holes. And I just want to give a little bit of an introduction and overview of these developments. Um, oh, is this not possible? Um, no, there we go. So this is a, a bit of an outline. I'm going to indeed first introduce the topic of quantum black holes. Then I'll uh, give a brief review of some um, concepts of quantum information theory that have entered into the uh, study of quantum black holes. So I'll bring this together then uh, in a third part. Finally, I want to say something about how space and time actually uh, sort of can be understood from this uh, perspective of quantum information theory, because that's sort of where the exciting developments are happening is that we're getting a, a new microscopic picture of uh, space-time using the language of quantum uh, information theory. So as I said, it's going to be an introductory talk. Um, there's actually a lot of uh, literature already more popular about this. I mean, actually, Xiaolong Li uh, Qi, who was supposed to speak here, actually wrote something about it. And he may have said something similar about, uh, well, gravity and space-time being related to quantum information. So indeed, I'm going to tell you things about uh, concepts of quantum information theory, like quantum teleportation and also quantum error correction. And the upshot will be uh, something like that space-time itself um, might be thought of as a um, quantum error correcting code. 
And actually, I'm uh, not just talking about other people's work. I'm not going to be very precise with references, but I do want to mention that one of the papers, early papers on mentioning quantum error correction in the context of study of black holes and, and uh, space uh, about uh, eight years ago. Um, I'm not going to go in detail there. It will be more general introduction, I hope, for people that have not a background in this area. So quantum black holes, I mean, black holes have sort of entered the mainstream uh, and people know about it, uh, first of all, uh, from popular culture, but also, I mean, the recent Nobel Prize for uh, Roger Penrose and, and his other uh, laureates. I mean, Roger Penrose, uh, together with Stephen Hawking, was, uh, were the first to sort of make clear that black holes are very generic and have to form uh, in very... Uh, generic situations and in particular they show that black holes uh, they form singularities and they form a horizon this is all in classical um, general relativity um, of course the breakthroughs came later uh, by stephen hawking and and uh, discovering more about the quantum nature and a particular insight that that played the central role is the idea that um, the horizon area of a black hole behaves very much like an entropy it always increases classically, and it satisfies analogous laws as those of thermodynamics. Eventually, it was recovered, uh, discovered that uh, indeed we can think about the horizon area as an entropy, um, and, and indeed it plays all, all the same roles. And this is described by the beckenstein hawking formula, where we have a very precise normalization in terms of G-Newton. Understanding this formula has been sort of the central topic of, of a lot of the development in, in, in theoretical physics, in my area at least, in the last uh, 30 years. And indeed, uh, by making contact with quantum information theory, you made a lot of progress uh, in this direction. So, uh, the true discovery of Hawking was that the black holes emit uh, thermal radiation, and they that radiation actually can be thought of as being created by, by uh, entangled pairs that are created near the horizon and then one of the pairs falls into the black hole and this already suggests some language in terms of quantum entanglement that I will make precise uh, as I go along. Now what is the consequence of this uh, radiation is that the black hole eventually will disappear, I mean it will evaporate and its horizon area will shrink. So uh, although classically the horizon area always will increase, class uh, quantum mechanically it may re be reduced. However, of course, the total entropy, which is the entropy of the, the black hole, this area, and uh, that of the radiation has to increase to be consistent with the, the, the second law of thermodynamics. So this was known for quite some time, but what we have been learning more recently is more how to think about this um, entropy in a more microscopic language using um, quantum information theory. And indeed, uh, the discovery of Hawking led to all kinds of puzzles First of all, what is the meaning of this uh, uh, entropy formula, but also what happens to information that uh, is thrown into the black hole. It's called the um, black hole information paradox. I mean, according to general relativity, information, well, disappears behind the horizon and cannot be recovered. However, quantum mechanics tells us that the information has to re reappear because uh, if it's described by a Schrodinger equation, Eventually, if we start with a pure state uh, where we have uh, complete information about the initial state, then a final state also should have all the information still uh, available. So uh, the question I'm going to be uh, discussing more precisely actually is the idea of throwing in some diary which contains some information into the black hole and then ask uh, how long does it take uh, for this information to reappear Indeed, if it reappears, I mean, indeed, when does it happen? And this, the answer is kind of surprising because, uh, of course, there's radiation coming out, but the, the black, the diary that is being thrown into the black hole really disappears and, and gets sort of uh, hidden behind the horizon. Turns out actually that this information that's in the diary uh, can be recovered quite, quite soon. And this uses ideas of quantum information theory. So let me now go to a very brief and short introduction of these concepts of quantum information uh, theory that are being used. I mean, we of course know quantum information theory uh, is different, quantum information is different than classical information in the sense it's described by qubits that have linear superpositions. 
I'm going to think about this diary as indeed being written in terms of uh, qubits later on. Um, so uh, the other thing, of course, that's needed uh, for describing uh, black holes is going to be this entanglement. And just uh, to remind you, I mean, there's uh, four uh, entangled states that I have uh, for, uh, say, two qubits. These are called bell pairs. And you can make those four states by using the, the logical operations on these qubits. I mean, there are uh, two uh, basic ones, namely the ones that exchange the zero and the one. And there's another one that uh, flips the sign of one while keeping the one of zero the same. They called X and Z. And those four bell pairs can be obtained by actually acting with these operations on one of the two uh, qubits. I mean, this is an important thing. I mean, I can make all of these four states by either uh, acting with only one, uh, uh, by, by only having access to one of these two uh, entangled qubits, and it doesn't matter which one. So I will denote these uh, entangled pairs with these uh, diagrams, and the states are sort of lines that come in. So the next idea that I'm going to use is something called quantum teleportation, which is, uh, of course, what is needed for building a quantum internet, and where we want to uh, transfer states. And so quantum uh, Teleportation works by giving two people uh, access to one uh, half of an entangled pair. And then the person that wants to send a, a qubit can do so by measuring a uh, bell pair, well, in which um, bell pair actually the, the photon and the uh, one entangled state, which is the white one in this picture, uh, you can project onto a bell pair and, and find out what is the outcome of your measurement and then send a classical signal, signal to the receiver. And in a diagram that looks like this, where the initial state uh, comes out and actually I think something disappeared from my diagram, oh, there it is. There's a, um, uh, a transformation that uh, you can then do uh, from the measurement uh, on this final state, I mean, on the, the entangled pair so that you reproduce uh, the state that comes in. So this is the basic idea of quantum teleportation. It uses a measurement and some classical signal. Now, this I'm going to actually generalize later and actually going to apply to my problem for uh, black hole uh, information. Uh, first, let me introduce one other concept, which is called quantum codes uh, and this error correction. I mean, qubits are susceptible to errors and can even be erased, but you can put check protect a qubit, and let me call it a secret qubit, against errors by encoding it into a larger number uh, of entangled qubits. And I can, for instance, uh, take one qubit and encode it in, in uh, five entangled qubits, or, or nine, I mean, uh, any pair, uh, any set goes. And I can do this in a way so that one can erase, uh, for the case of five, we can erase two, or in the case of nine, we can erase four qubits, and still recover this one secret qubit uh, from the remaining ones that I have open. So in general, actually, uh, this, this um, works for two n plus one angled tangled qubits where you erase up to n qubits uh, and you can still recover this secret qubit. So in, in the picture below, I've, I've shown this for a five qubit quantum code where you encode uh, a single qubit into five entangled pairs of entangled states and then uh, it's possible to recover the state still, even if you uh, re uh, remove or erase two of those qubits. And it doesn't really matter which two you do, as long as you have access to uh, more than half. So in this case, three. Well, this idea indeed plays a role in now uh, analyzing this uh, black hole uh, information paradox. So let me go back with uh, this knowledge to uh, this question I asked about black holes. And, and the information. As I mentioned, uh, black holes, uh, they radiate particles which are entangled, uh, and therefore uh, there's an increase of entanglement uh, between the black hole and the radiation. And eventually, if you wait long enough, um, you can think about the black hole as a set of entangled qubits. And that's precisely kind of like the state where I have two n uh, entangled qubits, namely uh, represented by n bell pairs. So this sort of a toy model of uh, thinking about a black hole and its radiation. And now we're going to throw in an additional uh, uh, qubit. Uh, actually, maybe I should mention one other thing. I mean, there's, as I said, you have to wait a little bit before um, this entanglement grows 
because if you start from a, a black hole without any radiation, it actually is not entangled with anything. So this is uh, the idea of what's called the page curve, that if you start from a black hole, which kind of is in a pure state, and then it starts emitting uh, radiation, there are two uh, entropies you can look at. One is the uh, entropy that is contained in the radiation that will increase. That's the line that goes up. But the black hole will radiate, and, uh, and eventually there's a line that uh, goes uh, down. But if you ask what is the entanglement entropy doing, initially it's actually increasing because there's more particles being emitted, and every time you increase the entropy, but the amount of uh, entanglement can never be larger than the en entropy of the black hole itself. And eventually, when the black hole disappears, we're back in a pure state without any uh, entanglement. And therefore, the entanglement entropy between the radiation and the black hole has to follow this green curve, which is called the page curve. And the situation I described in this picture on the previous slide actually is from after uh, the page time, namely when we are here, where the amount of entanglement is actually the same as the number of uh, quantum, the amount of quantum information that's contained in, in the black hole. It's in that situation that I can answer the question if I now throw in some additional uh, diary or some qubit, when can I recover it from the radiation? The question that was asked by Hayden and Preskill already uh, 13 years ago, but it's sort of the start of the link between quantum information theory and, and black. Uh, whole uh, well paradox. Actually, Page himself actually played an important role in that as well. So here's the picture again. We have the radiation coming from the black hole. The diary goes in, and on the right, I represent this as a state that's being put into the black hole, uh, an additional state that is being um, the black hole, which is uh, entangled with the radiation. And now the question is: Is that someone that's analyzing the radiation? When can the discover what is thrown into the black hole. An important thing is that, that when you throw something into the black hole, actually this information gets mixed with all the information of the black hole itself. There's some random unitary acting on this, which is the unitary evolution of, uh, of the Hamiltonian. But then what happens uh, next mainly is that I had the two entangled qubits representing the black hole and the radiation, but I've added one qubit. And then I'm in this situation of having two plus one entangled qubits. And you actually can think about this as an encoding of the black hole in these entangled pairs uh, which I have in. Actually, the total number of uh, qubits is 2n plus 1. Indeed, this single qubit is encoded in all of them and obeys this uh, quantum uh, error correction uh, um, rule that if I add one qubit, to the other one. So now the qubit here in this picture, the qubit is still contained into the black hole, but now we're going to wait and, and see some radiation, a Hawking particle being emitted in such a way that I'm uh, removing one qubit from the black hole and I have more qubits now in the radiation. Then it's possible to do a decoding in such a way that the state that I've thrown in actually can be recovered. So basically in this picture, it suggests that you can uh, recover the, the, the radiation or the state from the diary from the radiation uh, after you've received a little bit of Hawking radiation. It turns out you have to be, wait a little longer than just having one single qubit, but this is the basic idea. This was uh, indeed uh, discovered by Hayden and Preskill, and basically they said that information comes out very quickly uh, when you throw something into a black hole. And this is surprising, very surprising that uh, somehow by keeping uh, the track of the state of the, uh, the radiation, things that are thrown into black hole can be recovered uh, just by analyzing the quantum states very precisely. So I want to end with some uh, remarks about... Um... Am I still here? Yes. Do you still hear me? Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we do. Michael? We do hear you, Eric, but I, I'm afraid you don't hear me talking. Hello? Hello? Yes. Hello? 
Hey, Eric. Test, test. One, two, three. I think you're hearing you great. Michael? <laughs> can, can you hear us, uh, Eric? No. Just trying to send an emergency email saying that everything's okay. I don't know. Do you see me talking? Now I see you only, and I. I uh... Can you hear us now? Sorry. Or... I can it's, now it's hear you, good. but somehow I got all kinds of uh, messages that I wasn't uh, connected or something like that, and I couldn't hear anyone else. Oh, oh okay. Well, it's humorous or perfect, so just. Uh, ah, okay, just fine. Continue. Okay, then I continue. Yeah. And I want to. How many minutes do I have? Three? Uh, yeah, let's say three. Let's say three. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. All right. I just want to end with some uh, some property of space time uh, as a quantum uh, error correcting code. And this is sort of based on a, a little story. Uh, let me indeed ask a question. I have four uh, secret qubits and I want to encode them uh, in the following way. Each one is being encoded in nine entangled qubits. And I'm going to divide the qubits over three uh, people, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Alice gets five of the A qubits and Bob and Charlie each two, and the B qubits go five to Bob and Charlie and Alice get two, and the C qubits go to Charlie. And then the D qubits actually I divide differently. I give each, each one of them three. And the question is, uh, now each of them have 12 qubits and how can we, who can decode which secret? And it's pretty easy, of course. We know that when you have more than half of the qubits, you can decode it. And so you get a Venn diagram that looks like this, that Alice can encode A, uh, decode A, uh, Bob B, and Charlie C, but then D, uh, they cannot decode each one of them, but they can do this combinedly. And this is where, indeed, if you take Alice and Bob together, they get six of those qubits, and then they can decode it. So. Clearly, uh, this Venn diagram tells you when you can decode it. I'm sorry for writing down uh, pedantically that this is a Venn diagram. The reason I do so is that this picture has another interpretation, uh, which is not a Venn diagram, namely it's a picture of space and time. And this happens actually in what we call a holographic description of uh, uh, space time. Uh, we have some um, progress in, in, in string theory and black holes that led to this uh, universe with a negatively curved uh, space that um, is described quantum mechanically by, or microscopically by quantum theory on its boundary. But now you can ask how is this information from of the bulk actually contained in the, in the boundary? And you can do the same question. We give uh, Alice, Bob and Charlie only partly access to the boundary. And then you can ask who can recover which information in the bulk space time? And the answer is kind of clear. Uh, you get the same picture, uh, except now these uh, diagrams actually represent a part of space and time. And there's a part of the space that Alice can recover, a part that Bob can recover, and a part that uh, Charlie can recover. And there's also a part that only the three of them together, when they work together, or at least two of them, uh, can recover, which is this middle part. And so actually the conclusion is that space-time actually acts as a quantum uh, code. And uh, this is uh, work due to Almiri, Tong, and Harlow. And um, actually the nice thing is that even this picture indeed, as I said, is geometrically represents something because the area of these boundaries, actually these boundaries are minimal surfaces in the bulk and they tell you something about the amount of entanglement in the state. I think this is... Uh, a very nice application of quantum information theory and understanding more about the microscopic structure of quantum space times. And all of what I described is now actually has entered in, uh, well, m m these recent developments. I didn't even talk about these ideas of EPRs, ER, which is kind of the, the idea that if you throw all of the radiation also into a black hole, that there's some kind of wormhole connecting them. Indeed, this is sort of explaining how you can transfer information maybe from the black hole to the radiation. But uh, the recent developments that have happened here is that sort of combination of all of these uh, concepts have been used to sort of make progress in understanding quantum information theory problem. And this is sort of a, 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 another a popular uh, article that has been written in Quantum Magazine. And 
if you have listened to this talk, you can probably read this paper or this article also more easily. I think it's very uh, exciting, this development, because it gives a new perspective on, on what I call emergence of space-time. And there's even uh, sort of similarities between what's happening behind the horizon and, and in a cosmological space-time. So I, maybe this is indeed giving us uh, new, new ideas, even in other areas than just uh, black hole physics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric, uh, for your beautiful and inspiring talk. Um, we have some questions, uh, I hope. I think there's one in chat, so maybe I'll read it out to you. Uh, Aritro asks, the analogy between the Venn diagram, quantum information, ADS space, will this also work for the sitter space? Yeah, well, that's precisely the last question that I uh, was uh, posing is indeed, this is uh, an exciting uh, development is try to see whether this perspective on, uh, on space time from quantum information theory is more general than just an entity sitter space and whether we can take the lessons that we took from well uh, ADS safety or this black hole information problem to a cosmological setting it's not that clear yet I mean this is precisely where where the current uh, discussions are, are happening but I think this is what makes this exciting thank you um I don't see any other question maybe I'll ask a last question or a, a question um, so you have, you have this uh, article on your slide about the most famous paradox in physics near its end. Um, in your view, is the information paradox now basically resolved? Or if not, what, what are sort of the most urgent pressing questions? No, I think this, this, uh, there's an important breakthrough ha has happened in the sense that some of the quantum information theory language has mapped back onto a sort of more geometric picture. Uh, and I think that's exciting. Uh, for instance, we understand better also geometrically this, um, this page curve. But I think the actual mechanism by which the information comes out has not been understood yet. And I think there's a lot of things that need to be, uh, uh, well, improved in our understanding yet before we can claim that we have resolved the, the information paradox. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other question, maybe also in the interest of us uh, running late and in the interest of time, um, maybe this is a good opportunity to, to and so thanks very much, Eric. Thanks very much to all the speakers of the session today um, for the beautiful talks, um, both on behalf of uh, Jay and Jenna and I, I want to say this. Um, also, thanks to, to everyone for tuning in. So I, I hope you had a good time. I hope you'll have a great time at the rest of Feltover. <laughs>